Our next speaker is Jane Donnelly, Teach, Don't Preach Project. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jane Donnelly. I'm the Human Rights Officer um, for Atheist Ireland. The religious discrimination in Irish schools is a scandal. No government has tackled it properly, instead either defending it or tinkering at the edges. The recent referendum result should fundamentally change that. Governments can no longer assume that even Catholic parents want their children educated into Catholicism. The scale of the discrimination is unparalleled around the world. The Irish education system is unique. Irish schools are state funded, but privately run, 90% by the Catholic Church. Religion is integrated throughout the school day. State funded schools have the legal right to discriminate against children, parents and teachers on the grounds of religion. Atheist Ireland runs a website called Teach Don't Preach in which we document the discrimination and privilege and our campaigns to reform it. We have lobbied Irish and international politicians and human rights bodies. Many parents and students approach us for help as they really have nowhere else to go. If they approach the Department of Education, they are told that these types of complaints are for the schools themselves to deal with. Parents are left on their own dealing with private bodies who have exemptions in equality law. Many of them are afraid to speak openly as they fear that their child will be victimized. Atheist Ireland has an alliance with the Ahmadi Muslim community and the Evangelical Alliance of Ireland. We are three groups with very different worldviews, but we campaign together because our various communities are discriminated against on the grounds of religion in the education system. This discrimination undermines the human rights of parents and their children and makes us feel like second-class citizens. We have achieved 12 recommendations from the United Nations and Council of Europe bodies saying that Irish schools breach human rights. But so far, we have had less support from the European Parliament. Hopefully today, we, we can see the start of such support. The various committees at the UN and Council of Europe have said that the Irish education system is discriminatory, breaches the right to freedom of conscience of those parents seeking secular education for their children. There is no effective remedy and breaches the right to equality before the law and equal protection of the law without discrimination of any kind. Ireland continues to ignore these recommendations. The Irish Human Rights Commission and the Ombudsman for Children have also recommended that our education system reflects the rights guaranteed under the various conventions that Ireland has ratified. Successive governments have ignored these recommendations. The key to ending the religious discri discrimination in Irish schools is to tackle four areas at the same time. Atheist Ireland calls this the school's Equality Pact. The word pact is an acronym for the four areas that require change. Patronage, access, curriculum and teaching. The P in Schools Equality Pact stands for patronage. Children have a right to attend inclusive public schools where human rights are guaranteed and protected. Divesting some religious schools to new patrons will not achieve a pluralism in education. The Oireachtas Education Committee has already agreed with Atheist Ireland that multiple patronage and ethos can lead to segregation and inequality. State-funded schools should have an inclusive public ethos to respect everyone equally under Articles 42.1 and 42.3.1 of the Constitution. Moral education should be separate from religion, as per Article 42.3.2. The state should not cede control of education to private patrons. Private ethos schools should be an optional extra, <coughs> not the basis of the system. In Ireland, parents and their children, children are left dealing with private bodies, mainly religious. None of these bodies have ratified any UN treaty or the European Convention on Human Rights. 
it is nearly impossible to hold a private body responsible for breaching rights and especially when they are given exemptions to discriminate. In order to guarantee the rights of all families in the education system, the Education Act will need to be amended. The A in Schools Equality Pact stands for access. Children have an equal right to attend their local public school. Children should have equal access to their local state-funded school, whatever their religion. The current admissions to schools bill would outlaw some of this discrimination, but would still allow minority faith schools to discriminate. More importantly, there is no point in having equal access to a school that can then lawfully discriminate against you and evangelize you once you get in. This bill must be amended to also address the other three areas of the school's equality pact. <coughs> it is hard to believe that in Europe, religious minorities and the non-religious did not have access to their local publicly funded schools without religious discrimination. The C in school's equality pact stands for curriculum. Children have a right to an objective pluralist education. Children should be taught the state curriculum, including teaching about religions and beliefs in an objective, critical and pluralistic manner, as per the European Convention on Human Rights. Faith formation should be outside the school day. This requires amending sec section 15 b of the Education Act and the curriculum. When Ireland appeared before the UN Human Rights Committee, they were asked about access of children to a neutral studying environment outside the religious education class that they can opt out of. The state never responded to this question at the UN. The T in Schools Equality Pact stands for teaching. Teachers have an equal right to work in state-funded schools. Children should, not be, should, be, should be taught by the best teachers and teachers should have equal access based on merit to jobs in state-funded schools. Section 37 of the Employment Equality Act allows schools to discriminate against teachers on the grounds of religion. The recent Section 37 amendment protects Catholic LGBT teachers but reinforces discrimination against atheist and minority faith teachers. We need to amend Section 37 again to prevent all religious discrimination against teachers. The UN has recommended that minorities should have access to the teaching profession. They have said that denying minorities access to the teaching profession is discrimination. Unfortunately, the European Employment Equality Directive gives an exemption to Ireland to continue to permit private schools to discriminate on religious grounds. Ireland specifically lobbied for this exemption and got it. In Ireland, the vast majority of our schools are publicly funded private schools. This means that minorities cannot find employment in schools unless they have a Catholic certificate in religious studies, are prepared to teach Catholic religious instruction and uphold the Catholic ethos in the vast majority of schools. The exemption in the European Employment Equality Directive means that religious discrimination against minorities in the te teaching profession continues. It is really difficult to accept that the EU continues to support this type of religious discrimination when the UN are re recommending that it has to stop. To conclude, the religious discrimination in Irish schools is a scandal. No government has tackled it properly, instead either defending it or tinkering at the edges. The recent referendum result should fundamentally change that. The key to ending the religious discrimination in Irish schools is to tackle the four areas of Atheist Ireland Schools Equality Pact, patronage, access, curriculum and teaching. We have achieved 12 recommendations from the United Nations and Council of Europe bodies saying that Irish schools breach human rights, but so far we've had less support from the European Parliament. Hopefully today we can see the start of such support. Thank you. three remaining speakers and I'm going to ask the three remaining speakers to really really if you can keep it to within 10 minutes so that we can have that half an hour discussion before we break for 12. Time is moving on so uh, try and keep it to the 10 minutes if you can. Really appreciate it otherwise um, I'll start sending notes which won't be good. So sorry I could introduce Sophia. Sophia 
Marques da Silva uh, from the University of Porto. She came to, uh, to Ireland last night and we really, really are appreciated that you made the effort to join us today. So you have the floor, Sophia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to, to be here, even if it's just for a short period. I hope that what I'm going to, to tell you makes sense to you as well, because I, I try to bring some more European perspective and some examples from other countries, also from Portugal, but I try to compare also with Irish examples that, uh, that I also search for. Um, so, uh, I've been teaching uh, uh, since the early 90s. I started as a secondary education uh, teacher in the border regions of Portugal, in the countryside, uh, very inland, and uh, Sometimes I feel that I'm repeating things over and over again in what concerns equality in education. So this can't be good. Uh, but at least we are all here discussing this. So um, my... Uh, so this is my argument, is that Europe is waste, wasting talent. Uh, because we are not taking advantage of all the people and all the diversity that we have in Europe uh, and in our countries, of course, in particular. And I am going to focus specifically on gender issues and how we are losing talent because we are not uh, uh, taking care of equality in what concerns gender, education, both for women and for men. So this is not a women's issue. This is a society issue. Um, and that's my first, my first point. So things are really, really tough to, to change because we are talking about uh, structural inequalities and structures are really, really hard to, to change. And I am very traditional in what concerns sociology of education theories. So I might die being a structuralist and I might die defending Bourdieu perspectives on reproduction. I'm sorry, it's true. It's a, well, postmodern is very interesting, but I think that we are still stuck in the very old uh, structural inequalities based on social class, on gender, on ethnicity, but also on age, on geography, uh, and, and the combination of everything, it's, that's what is really hard to change. And that's why the intersectionality theory is very interesting because it helps us to understand how can we analyze discrimination and inequality uh, in the same person when we have different inequalities combined in the same person? And that's that's uh, so. This is the, the the situation that we have at this moment in Europe. Not at this moment. Two years ago, that's the recent data that we we are allowed to to, to work with. And as you can see, you are a little bit better than, than Portugal, but this is a gender pay gap, and this is a problem. Uh, so this is the first issue that concerns the gender gap, and all came, uh, uh, the start is it's, uh, it's based in, in education. So uh, the other problem in the, in the, concerning the gender gap and the gender uh, inequalities concerns representation there is under or over representation of men and women in different study fields and this is the situation in what concerns graduates and uh, in different fields and if you see it you can uh, understand that there are traditional male fields and traditionally female fields that are still occupied mainly by women as education or health uh, and uh, male traditional fields like ICT and engineering. And this is still the same, and this is a problem. And in Portugal, we are having very uh, awful consequences on this because we are in a very strong need of people working on ICT, and we don't have that people. So companies are threatening us uh, um, uh, about leaving the country because we don't have enough um, people trained in that areas um, for, for the needs of course so the other um, the, the other aspect that I would like to bring here is how the attainment in higher education so as you can see we have more 
at European level more female than male. So this is very um, this is very clear. So women are having more success in higher education. Uh, we are there in a, in a large quantity, but when we break down uh, the numbers, we can realize again the segregation in what concerns study field. So this is the situation of Portugal, Ireland, and uh, Europe in general. So um, your results are better than ours in Portugal, um, both for men and, and women, but in the, in the same case, so female are in more quantity in attaining higher education. But the issue is that when we are talking about employment rates, uh, this doesn't match with the previous slide. So meaning that the fact that women are achieving more in education uh, doesn't translate in more and better jobs. So there's something here that needs to be uh, solved. So this is just an example of ICT specialists. So I just uh, emphasized Portugal case and Ireland case. Uh, so you have a little bit more women in uh, ICT specialists. Nevertheless, we can figure it out the difference and how it is distributed by gender in, in this field. So we have a problem of gender segregation and this translates also in different uh, opportunities for men and women in private life or in public life or in jobs opportunities. So the choices are very narrow still. Uh, so the context of gender segregation are study fields, career choice, labor, labor markets, and as you can see, 20% of women against 50% of men are very low paid, work very few hours paid per, per week, and have low job security. And this translates in more poverty as well. So, so there is underrepresentation of women in ICT and STEM, and underrepresentation of men in education, health, and welfare. And so, this, uh, these numbers also need to change both for men and women to be able to participate in different, um, in different contexts. So there are a lot of persistent inequalities um, and uh, of course more precarious jobs as well, poor jobs for, for women, an equal division of unpaid responsibilities within the household. So this combination of factors are, uh, uh, have these consequences on women's uh, opportunities to, to, to work in proper jobs, especially in those where they are uh, less. So equality in education can't be taken for granted. I think that we, we've all heard this here uh, before me. Uh, and there is these concerns for a long time. This is one example, the Beijing Platform for Action since 1995, they organized these critical areas. Uh, and I'm going just to talk on some indicators from education and training of women. So this, this is, this is a, really a concern that is not from today or from yesterday. So this is a, a, a long-term concern. So this is how they calculate the, the, the figures in not concerned education and training proportion of women and men in tertiary education, employment rate of women and men, and proportion of female and male academic staff, which is also uh, interesting figures to, to analyze. So this is what, what uh, this is another uh, strategy, the strategic engagement for gender equality from the European Union, and these are the main aims of this, uh, of this uh, strategy. Um, so increase women in the labor market, reducing the gender pay gap, increasing the male and female autonomy, fight gender-based violence, promote equality. So this small picture over there, it's a picture that I took for young girls. They are dancing a traditional male dance. This is from Celtic origins in the north of Portugal. And they are dancing a dance which is not allowed, was not allowed for women because it was the dance of spades, or the men's dance. 
uh, like a ritual of initiation. And they were allowed now to dance because none of the boys of these communities wanted to dance anymore. So women are allowed to enter male fields because um, there are no boys that are wanted to, to do that. So this is very interesting for us to analyze how can we tackle this. Uh, so they are now a little bit owners of this, of this uh, tradition, but they were not allowed to do it before. Um, so I think some of these aspects were already uh, mentioned by our first keynote as well, the issues of access process and, and success. So we know that girls are outperforming boys, the levels of dropout and early school leaving are higher among boys, and this is a problem. This is something that we need also to, to solve. Uh, we all have in our countries, or uh, in the majority of the European uh, countries, formal equality. But this formal equality exists at the same time there are stereotypes and segregation in the same context, namely in the school context. So there is impact. And there is impact not only in what in social sciences and humanities we are used to analyze, which is a matter of citizenship and social justice. Uh, but if we want to convince uh, governments, maybe we need sometimes to convince them through other kind of impacts, which is economic impact. And there is economic impact and impact of this segregation in economic growth. And this is very easy to, 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 to find this kind of data. Uh, so recent findings are uh, arguing that gender equality would have positive impact in economic growth because it would create more employment possibilities, more, more jobs, and the GDP would increase. This is a, 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 um, a quotation from uh, Kristalina Gergieva, which is the CEO of the World Bank, and well, how she did the math, and this is what she came to. So um, this is the impact uh, of this. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is the impact in the economic growth, well, so differentiated pavement as I, as I already told, told you, and, um, and the ICT again, and the STEM education, this is very interesting to, to see how if we just solve this small problem in uh, ICT, we would create 1.2 million jobs in Europe. So this is come from a study from this uh, institution uh, that are doing research on gender. So, and to finish, uh, I need help because I am now responsible to organize a national program to improve girls in ICT in Portugal. Uh, I am working in this um, uh, INCODE initiative. Uh, so you saw that I didn't prepare this well, so a lot of slides. So this is the initiative, and uh, I'm involved in this since last year, and now I'm responsible to try to promote girls in ICT, and I have to figure it out how to do it. And uh, this is not, this is needs to be an integrated approach involving universities, involving companies, involving schools, involving parents. And this is not easy. There are a lot of examples in Europe. Some of them are working really, really well. So if you have any suggestions on how can we do it, uh, besides what we already know, I would appreciate your, your help. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. John Schiel, that note didn't necessarily say finish up. It could have been a note about anything. So, on Keith kind of already we have, I'm really, because uh, I'm sitting next to you, I can just give you a dig in the back. Yes. Um, so, dear Mr. Player, OASTI, you have the floor. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And even though it's a beautiful sunny June morning on a Saturday, it's a very sincere thank you because I have my baby baby doing his leaving cert at the moment. And it's a great relief to be out of the house for a day. <laughs> um, I'm going to ram my contribution is going to be a bit of a ramble across issues. The title tackling discrimination in education is so huge. Uh, one of my roles as Deputy General Secretary of the ASTI is I'm responsible for equality in the organization. So I'm just going to touch on a few of the issues uh, of discrimination and lack of inclusion that we come across 
in schools and in the education system. And obviously the focus is mainly here at this, uh, rightly, on students and learners, but given my role, I will also be talking about the inequalities and the discrimination that many teachers would face in their, their jobs. And I'm kind of going through it under the headings of almost the nine grounds and then maybe some general stuff at the end, but we'll see. I will wrap up very quickly when needed. Um, in terms of gender, for example, it's almost counterintuitive that there would be pay gaps in the public sector based on pay, based on gender, but of course there are. And they happen for various reasons. One is that women are far more likely to take career breaks or to take, uh, take time out to job share uh, early in their career, which of course puts them lower down the salary scales and takes them longer to get up. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that, that has to be tackled and has to be looked at, and it's a very difficult one. And we would see it that certainly when people are retiring and you're discussing or want to retire early and you're discussing how many years they have, it's the women who are more likely to have the problems and the difficulties because they have taken the time to spend with their families. And that's just something maybe it's a much huger societal issue as how we punish people for spending time with their children. And I speak as somebody who spent four years at home with my own children. And, it, and it's a very rewarding thing, but you do find, and you also find you get particular, you get funny looks from people about it as well if you're a man. Although, I also used to get a lot of congratulations from people, and I always said, why are you congratulating me? If my wife was doing it, you wouldn't be congratulating her. But that's a, that's a total aside. And then obviously in the issue of promotion, <coughs> um, we have a female principal, the president of the NAPD up there in our audience, a member of ours, but still, women are less likely to achieve the positions of deputy principal and particularly of principal. Partly because they are less likely to go for those jobs because, they, again, they are so onerous. The workload is, has got so out of hand that people are saying, you know, my priorities are different. And in recent years, that has improved slightly. But actually, you would need, if you were to, if people talk about they sh we should have equality in terms of the number of male and female principals. In fact, what you should be aiming for is proportionality, which would mean that two-thirds of our principals would be women, because two-thirds of our teachers are women, and we're a long way from that. Some small achievements, for example, until very recently, if you were a teacher, you were entitled to breast breaks to breastfeed up to the stage of 26 weeks after birth. So in other words, you were entitled to a break to breastfeed while you were on maternity leave. We have managed to succeed in changing that. To, yes, <laughs> it was a bit ridiculous. We have now managed to uh, get the department to agree that that should now be extended to two years. We hope there'll be a takeaway. It'll be difficult because I, I think for teachers, there are very few schools with creches, so it will be people looking for breaks to express. But hopefully, we will not get resistance from the management bodies about timetabling and facilities and whatever, but it is, it is the kind of achievement that is, is welcome. We are also, uh, we have put motions to Congress and, and to the National Women's Council to seek for proper leave for women who have miscarriages or, or stillbirths, because it, it's not an illness, but it's, it, that's the only way. You, you can't get sick leave and you can't take maternity leave, and, and we think that that's an issue that should be tackled importantly. And an issue we've been working on an awful lot in recent years is the whole issue of LGBTQI plus rights. That's getting longer and longer, that list, but uh, importantly so. There's a changing landscape. Schools are finding more and more, particularly on the transgender issue, uh, children, students coming out. We think the equality referendum probably had a huge impact on that, giving people confidence to do that. And I have to say the response in general from the education system has been very, very positive from the department and the management bodies, uh, whether they be religious or not, to be fair, it has been very, very positive. Um, but like a lot of things, there's the positive attitude, but also resources. Uh, and I, I would make a plea to anybody here who has any influence. Tenny, the, uh, the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland, are, are putting together proposals uh, to get funding because they don't have a full-time education officer. And that's a kind of issue as well. We, we, can, we can do all the speaking in the world about not discrimination. But if we don't back that up with resources, Pavi Point, who we work with and try and work with, have no education officer at the moment because their education officer was dependent on some scheme which ran out. That is wrong. And they should be, organizations like that should be properly funded to provide the support so that we have a resource as well, and say in the teachers' union or in the teachers' profession, to talk to the people, because too long in this country, discrimination and areas of discrimination are tackled by people saying, 
well, I'm I'm very well minded. I I I. I thoroughly in favour of ending discrimination and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to do it rather than actually asking the people who are suffering the discrimination how we should tackle it. Uh, we had a recent meeting with Pavy Point and we had two young travellers in, one, one slightly older, who, and they, they recounted very, very different experiences of school, partly generational because things have got better, but also schools differ. And one of the things they talked about quite graphically was when there are supports, how they are supplied. There was a very young woman who was very, very articulate. She's in third level and she said the school were absolutely brilliant because there were lots of supports there, but the supports were subtle and quiet. Whereas the older traveler was talking about his experience, when I say older, in his 30s, of any supports were practically public. And so that everybody knew that you were getting these supports, which again is so wrong. And while schools, again, the resources have been cut, visiting teachers for travellers were got rid of a few years ago, and schools differ because there are schools, it, there's a huge problem of trying to retain travellers in education, and some schools, I think, are happy to let that happen, and some schools put in a whole lot of work on the other side, and we have to work on that. I'm not going to go through all the issues here, we won't have time, we're working on dealing with refugees. I want to touch on Section 37. The reforms to Section 37 were very important. I do believe they have provided some improvements in terms of the religious grounds, but Section 37 just has to go. That is, it's quite simple. Yeah. And, and Section 37 should be, uh, not, should not, should have been amended. It was very good it was amended, but it should be abolished. And I were calling on any people with influence there to work on that. Um, just on more general points in terms of disadvantage, there's a couple of things. For example, the JESH project to tackle disadvantage, worthy as it is, it has one crucial problem. The majority of children from disadvantaged backgrounds are not in JESH schools. If you're not in a JESH school, you don't get the supports. And also, the qualification for JESH when it came in, at, at primary level, it was basically on socioeconomic data. At secondary level, it was on socioeconomic data, but also on achievement. You dropped out of DESH if you had a high retention rate, if you had two good results. So you were punished for taking disadvantaged children, keeping them in school, and, and them doing well. And it was a, it is a particular problem in rural areas, in rural, uh, for rural disadvantage. Uh, and, and we'd like that to be looked at. I, th things were touched about educational reform, just I beg people who are involved in educational reform, do not make the mistakes that were made in the junior cycle. Seriously talk to the practitioners before you come up with your reform. Talk to the teachers, then, then come up with a project. Not try and do a top-down reform, it's not going to work. And, uh, and also, um, the, the, there's a worry about, there are lots of problems with the system at the moment. As I say, I see, I see the, the problems my child is facing going through the Leaving Cert. But let's be clear where some of these come, come from. The point system is not run by the second level education system. It's run by the universities. And the universities, and it is not the job of second level schools or of teachers to produce undergraduates. The university seems to be dem demand that. That's not what our job is. Our job is to, to educate children, to give them knowledge, but also to, to, give, to be rounded, fully developed citizens, some who will pursue academic careers, some who will pursue other careers. And I'm going to finish up, I've lots more I could say, but I just want to finish up on one point. It would be very, very remiss of me talking about equality in education, not to mention the deliberate inequality foisted on education by a government several years ago, a problem that has not been solved, and that is the problem of pay inequality for teachers. It is utterly, utterly wrong yeah. that young teachers would have to teach on a lower salary than their Thank you. Well, now I didn't have to stop you because, you know, everything that you said was, was very, very valid, as have all our contributors. So, coming to the final speaker, and then we'll open it up to the floor for all of you guys to come in uh, with your views and questions and comments. Uh, Carl Kitching from UCC. So, um, I work in UCC as the Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not here as a UCC boss to try and, try and uh, settle what we're doing to you. 
necessarily, or uh, of course we're proud of certain things that we're doing, but I want to talk particularly about one area of discrimination. It's not to create a hierarchy of oppressions or anything like that, but just to kind of focus on an area of discourse that I believe we've completely underdeveloped in this country. Um, so the area that I'm focusing on actually is the area that I do research in, which is race and racism in education, in, particularly in the school sector, but also uh, looking at some of my experience of the higher education sector. The way that we talk about racism uh, and the way that racism gets, I suppose, brought to official attention in the school sector at the moment is largely through the anti-bullying procedures, which are a statutory requirement of primary and post-primary schools uh, to report and deal with um, various forms of bullying, including identity-based bullying, which includes bullying on the basis of um, race or ethnicity. Uh, we have um, free anti-bullying training resources for parents, a website, but if you look at the inspector report, which, which, which surveyed parents and, and young people and children from post-primary and primary schools, it talked about the culture of bullying generally, uh, rather than, rather than I, I suppose, uh, looking at identity-based identity bullying in and of itself. The limitations of the bullying focus, I'm not saying focusing on bullying and harassment isn't important, but it misses out a key aspect of understanding, particularly race and racism. We understand that gender inequality is a structural problem. We understand that class inequality is a, is a structural problem. Uh, we understand that religious discrimination is, a, is an institutional and structural problem. Uh, structural problem, but we don't have that discourse about race and ethnicity in the same way, despite uh, the advances that have been made in relation to spy cyber groups and in relation to cyber education, um, notwithstanding again the cutbacks. So the limitations of the bullying focus is that it reduces racism to student-student interactions, effectively, inadvertently blaming children and young people for being racist, right? Uh, it places undue responsibility on children and young people to actually engage with racism and and my, my argument is that it neglects institutional racism and majoritarianism, which includes uh, the sectarianism uh, within our school sector. Um, the research shows that institutional racism, which is the discourse that I be, what I, I'm, I'm arguing we need to have, uh, is embedded in Irish education. Clearly, we have a history of that in terms of travel education outcomes. There is also plenty of research which shows that we have an overfocus in our schools on migrants being good migrants as opposed to looking at their achievement levels, as opposed to engaging them as complex human beings with a variety of different needs and strengths. Uh, there's clear evidence in the Irish system that there is harassment of asylum seeker children because they live in direct provision. Um, and uh, the, I suppose a lot of the solidarity that is shown for asylum seekers through the education system, like for example the campaign for Nonso uh, coming from Tullamore College at the moment who is at risk of deportation, it talks about him as an amazing student, and it always talks about students who are, who are at risk of deportation as amazing students. We have migrant students have to be incredible in order to be recognised as human beings sometimes in our system. Um, migrants around the world; uh, these aren't issues that are germane, are unique to Ireland. You know, around the world, migrant and minority ethnic families are stereotyped. It's hard to reach. I'm not saying that teachers and schools aren't doing their best, and this is not. Uh, um, I suppose it's not blaming teachers. Uh, but we have to understand that uh, we are implicated in these practices when we when we form discourses that uh, describe people as hard to reach. And ultimately, there has been a lack of systematic professional development for teachers in interculturalism and anti-racism. There are fantastic programs like the Yellow Fly program that the Irish Travel Movement have initiated. Again, no, no state funding for those, these kinds of programs. Um, so broadening out, broadening out the discourse, we need to challenge uh, everyday racist microaggressions, everyday racism, everyday othering, which may be well-intentioned, but ultimately reminds migrant and minority ethnic people, young people and par par parents, that they are the other, they are not the norm, or they are not part of us. Um, it's important to remember when, we're, when we talk about race and racism that not all racist discourse is equally damaging, right? If, some, if a white person is... Um, given a racial epithet or an insult, it does not have the same effect on white people or the majority ethnic group as it does on minority ethnic groups. So this kind of idea of re reverse racism needs to be understood as a myth, right? And the, the discourse of playing the race card is also used to shut down talk about racism as well, um, regularly. Um, providing systematic professional development for teachers, the migrant integration strategy does make some nods in this direction, and I'll be talking to Minister Stanton uh, towards the end of this next week, actually, about this to see where the progress has been. Um, ensuring migrant and minority ethnic representation on decision-making bodies, 
not just who makes the tea or organizes um, a multicultural day or different things like that. I'm not saying those things aren't, aren't important, but children and young people of minority ethnic backgrounds and their parents need to be on decision-making bodies uh, that have an influence on how schools are developed. And democratic school cultures uh, is something that we need to work on. And of course, you know, I, I give you uh, um, the Jews um, for uh, patrons like Educate Together who are developing that democratic ethos. They're not the only ones, uh, but it's important to recognize that. Uh, annual, annual school climate and culture audits. These things, these things are actually recommended in, in National Co Council for Curriculum and Assessment Guidelines from 13 years ago. They're not happening. Um, and developing curriculum that's truly engaged in the experiences of diverse students. Very quickly on higher education. Um, the National Access Plan, great intentions, some very good targets, and it focuses on these, <coughs> these particular target groups. Um, which is wonderful. We have path funding, um, and there's three strands of that, one of which um, looks at my own area, which historically which has been teacher education, uh, student teachers, and diversifying the student teacher population, which is incredibly homogenous uh, at the moment, um, which is again a problem around the world. Um, but one of the big issues with the path funding program is that uh, while, you know, while it's good that we have these targets, it requires people to always be socioeconomically disadvantaged. Right. I'm, again, that's important that we, we focus on, on that, but racism in itself, for example, is an independent form of discrimination. Middle class families uh, who are of minority ethnic background or migrant background experience racism. They experience um, uh, various forms of discrimination that are not necessarily related to their um, class status or their income level. Um, and also our national access plan, as, as um, Leonie as well as alluded to, that our asylum seekers and refugees are not explicitly supported. And it's through the, the universities and the IOT, IOTs pushing, um, I suppose, the university and, and Institute of Sanctuary agenda that hopefully some change may come. So the needs at higher education level, recognizing racism as an independent factor and barriers to education progression, providing free access to third level uh, to asylum seekers and refugees, who, um, regardless of their, their years of residency in this country, uh, documenting and taking action on the numbers of minority ethnic staff in junior and senior academic positions. We're trying to begin that in UCC now. Uh, greater coordination with secondary and further education sectors regarding transitions to third level. I'm managing our sanctuary scholarship scheme, which is a pilot, which is in its pilot year this year. Um, one of the ma major issues we're finding is that uh, children and young people coming through the secondary and further education sector are being given um, sometimes very poor advice, maybe with the best of intentions, and you know, obviously there are financial, major financial barriers with people who are classed as international students. Uh, but there is a huge job of work to be done around guidance uh, for asylum seeking refugee students. I'm not, it's, again, it's not attacking guidance counseling or guidance <coughs> counselors, particularly given the, the, the cuts that have been made there. Uh, but there is a massive job of work to be done around coordinating um, pathways uh, in relation to asylum seeking refugees in particular. And finally, developing that, those curricula that truly engage the experiences of diverse students we cannot continue a situation where we have a very diverse student body and they are not seeing um, minority ethnic role models uh, standing in front of them uh, and they're not hearing their own life experiences reflected back to them uh, or, or having their life experiences engaged in the classroom. So there's, there's some problems and hopefully some solutions. So thanks. As to all the speakers, I think you know you could just hold a conference just on local teachers, you know, just on on you know racism. There are so many different things I suppose that we're trying to cover here. But look, at least it's giving us, although it's skimming the surface, it's food for thought, uh, which is important for all of us to go away from today to think about those.